Hi, so today I'm going to talk to you about Git. Git is a distributed version control system. It was created by Linus Torvalds, uh, who also created the Linux kernel. And my focus in this video is going to be the basics of Git and using it to manage your Hives projects and also using it to pull the latest version of Hives from GitHub when you're building it from source. So Git is mainly a command line tool, although there are some GUIs for it. Uh, one GUI is actually built into the Atom text editor, so if you use this editor, you can go to View, toggle the Git tab, and you have uh, some Git controls and GitHub controls as well. I don't actually use this. We're going to be using the command line in this video. I think the command line is quite easy to use. So Git works locally on your machine and it keeps track of changes you make to files in specific folders and you can choose which folders. And when you set up a folder to be tracked by Git, we call that folder a Git repository or a repo for short. So Git can track any files pretty much, but it works best when you're tracking human readable files like text files, XML, um, scripts, uh, HTML, that kind of thing. And the reason for this is Git actually tracks the contents of those files. It, it can compare different versions and it can see where changes have been made. And obviously if it's a binary format, if it's something like a, a, a pre-compiled executable file or a, a DLL or something like that, Git won't be able to see the contents of that file to track it accurately. It will only be able to track it based on timestamps and metadata and things like that. The other advantage of tracking human readable files is if there's something that you need to manually um, take care of, if there's a, a merge conflict, which we'll talk about in a bit, you can actually go into a human readable file and edit it and fix the problem. We're also going to look at GitHub in this video, and GitHub is a website that allows you to upload your local Git repository, and that allows you to share your code with other people for collaborative purposes or just to share it. You can also keep your um, repositories on GitHub private. You have to pay for a subscription for that, but you can keep them private and then you can just use it for um, sharing code within a, a sort of private group if you're working with a team of people or whatever and you want to keep it private. So installing Git is pretty easy. I've got the website open here and I'm not going to go through installing it on the uh, three different operating systems. If you're on a GNU Linux operating system, I believe it's built into the kernel. It was actually originally developed by Torvalds for his development of the Linux kernel. Uh, but it, it's really easy to install. The instructions are here and I'll put a link to this in the video description so you can find this page. Uh, with uh, Windows, it's just uh, an EXE installer. And with Mac, I think you install it through the terminal. But the instructions are there and it doesn't take long to install. One note about when you install the Windows version, it will give you an option to install an additional a terminal window. I recommend you do that because it works better with Git than the uh, built-in terminal in Windows. Okay, so let's just jump right in and we'll start with a simple example. So I'm going to make a folder on the desktop and I'm going to set it up to be tracked by Git. So I'll create a new folder. I'll call it a project. And we'll open up that folder. I'll just close this other pane here. We don't need to see that. And uh, we can get rid of that as well. So we're just looking at this one folder on the desktop. And you need to open a command line or terminal window and navigate to this folder. So on Linux Mint, it's really easy. I just click this button. But if you're on Windows or a Mac, you'll open your terminal and you'll type cd. And that's the command for change directory. And then you just type the path to the folder that you want to go to. So now in the terminal, I'm in that folder. And if I type dir to list all the files in that folder, it will just come back blank because there are no files in there yet. So let's add a file. So we'll just add a text file. I'll call it a text file. And in the terminal, I can type dir again. And we can see there's our file in there. And the reason it adds those backslashes after each word is because it has spaces between the words. So when you've got spaces between in the terminal window, if I type something like a text file, it sees each of those words as a separate command unless it's either in quotation marks 
or it's got what's called an escape character, which is the backslash. So that's the reason for those slashes. Okay, let's add some text to our text file. So I'm just going to type some text. And press Control S to save that, and we'll just put that over there for now. And I'll make that a bit smaller. Just rearrange things here so we can see everything at once. Okay, and we'll have the terminal window. I can go there, it'll be fine. Okay. So far, we created a folder, we've added a text file, and we put some text in that file. So now we're going to use our first git command. And all git commands start with the word git. So we type git, and we want to turn this folder, this app project folder, into a git repository. So we've got to make sure we're in the folder in the terminal, which we've already done. We've cd'd to that folder. And we're going to type git, and then the word init. And that's short for initialization, and that's going to turn this folder into a git repository. So I hit enter and it says initialized empty git repository in that location. And you can see it's got this dot git file. Well, we can't see that here. And that's because on uh, GNU Linux, a dot file is invisible by default. It's actually a folder in this case. So if I press control H to show hidden files, we can now see this dot git file. And you won't really ever need to go into here unless you're doing more advanced things. We're not going to um, do anything in here in this video, but let's have a look inside. So this is just where Git keeps track of all your files and keeps track of different versions and things like that. But you won't really ever need to go into there, like I say, unless you're doing advanced things. I don't think I've ever had to go into the Git folder. So just know it's there, it's a hidden file, it's tucked out of the way, and it's handling everything in the background. Okay, so we've initialized a git repository, we've got a file in there, we've got some text in our file. So now let's see what git is tracking currently, and to do that we type git status, and hit enter. And it says we're on the master branch, we'll talk about branches in a bit. No commits yet, we'll talk about commits in just a moment. And it says untracked files, and then it's found our our text file. So it's saying it hasn't, it's, it's not tracking any files yet. So we need to tell it which files to track, you see. And here it actually gives instructions. It says use git add and then the file to include in what will be committed. So let's talk about that first. So the idea with git is you make some changes to a file or a whole collection of files and then you put them in what's called the staging area. And then let's say you make some changes to some other files and you add those to the staging area as well. And you can add as many files to the staging area as you want. And if you change your mind, you can take some out. And then once you're happy and you say, okay, this is a collection of files that represent some significant change, you commit that. And what that does is it tells Git to keep this as a, a kind of snapshot. And these snapshots are called commits. And you commit that and all the files that are in the staging area will be part of that snapshot. So we've only got one file for now, so we're going to commit that. And it's kind of traditional that your very first commit is just called your initial commit. So we're going to add this file to the staging area using the command that is suggested there, git add. So we've written git add, and then we have two choices. We can either write the name of the file, which is fine when you're just tracking one specific file. But if you have lots of files or you're just feeling lazy and you want to track all of them, you can just put a dot. And I think you can also put a backslash A as well. And that will add them all to be tracked. And now if I type git status, we can now see the file has turned green and it says new file. And when it's green, that means it's in the staging area. So red means it's not in the staging area, but it's a change that git hasn't yet tracked. Green means it's in the staging area waiting to be committed. Now, if you change your mind and decide, actually, you didn't want to add that file to the staging area, you can type git. In fact, it tells us right here what we can do. We can type git rm, which is for remove, 
dash dash cached and then the name of the file you've changed your mind about. So I've hit enter on that and it says it's rm to that file and if I type git status again we'll see it's gone back to being read and it's no longer being tracked so let's re-add it and I'm just going I'm, I'm using the up and down arrows here on my keyboard and I can go through the previous commands I've typed in so that's just a handy shortcut so we're going to do that git add a git status and it's back in the staging area okay so once you've got it in the staging area and it's time to commit it and make that commit snapshot here you type git commit and then you're going to provide a little message as well just to say what this commit is so when you come back to look at it you can go oh okay those are the changes that i made to these files so you type dash m which is short for message and then a quotation mark and you're going to type the message so we'll call this one initial commit and then a closing quotation mark and then we hit enter so now that's been committed and it tells us there one file change one insertion and create mode uh, whatever that means a text file and now if I type git status we can see we're back to nothing to commit okay so let's make another change so that's some text now let's put another change and I'm going to save that and we'll type git status again and you can see it's saying oh there's a change that's been made so it says change is not staged for commit and it's this one and it tells us it's been modified so we're going to add this again so we'll do git add and I'm just going to type a dot this time it's the same as doing the dash a and now this file's in the staging area I'm going to commit it and I'm going to put a message um, added another change and it's important that when you write these messages I mean I'm just doing simple examples here but when you do them for your actual project you want to put something meaningful so if you've added a synthesizer module put that as you commit but I've added the synthesizer module and that way if say you're trying to debug your code in the in the future and you find out that an earlier version before the synthesizer was added it worked but then after you added the synth module it doesn't work you'll easily be able to find where that change occurred because you'll have it there in your commit history. So I'm going to hit enter. So we've made that change now. And again it says one insertion and what it means by that is we've inserted another line of text in this file. So because this is a human readable file, Git can actually see the exact changes we've made in here. Okay, now let's have a look at the list of commits that we've made so far. So first of all, I'm going to type the word clear. This isn't a git command, this is just a terminal command, just to clear the window. And we're going to type git log. And this is going to show the commits that we've made so far. We've only made two, but it shows what we've made. So there's the initial commit, and there's, that's the commit message we put in, and it's got the date and who did it, that was me. And then we've added another commit, or added another change, which is what I typed in there, and the date and time, etc. Now these numbers here, after the word commit, these are called commit hashes, and they're basically an ID for each commit. So if you want to go back to a previous version, you can copy this ID. So let's copy this one from the initial commit. And you can type git checkout, and then you can paste that ID in and hit enter. And it's now taken us back to a previous version. So our file hasn't updated here, but uh, now I've clicked in it, it's saying that the file has changed. So if I click reload, you can see we're actually in the original version. And we get a load of text here, which says you're in a detached head state. So what this means is uh, Git works on a timeline with branches going off. So you can, you can be at one point in a timeline and then branch off to make some changes and then come back to a different point on the timeline. But we're in what's called a detached head state. So the head is the furthest point in the timeline, that's like the last part on that particular branch. And we're detached from it, we're not actually on a branch, we're sort of floating off to the side. And that means any changes we make don't have anywhere to be committed to. So we have to make a new branch to commit those changes. So if I make another change in here, so let's call this detached head change. And I've saved that file now. 
type git status, it shows us we have a, a text file there. And if I type git add and git commit, added detached change. So it says it's inserted it at the detached head. It's not saying it's inserted it on a branch because we don't have a branch. So this commit that I've made isn't going to be permanent. It's not going to be saved. So we need to make a new branch to actually save it. And the easy way to do that is to git checkout. So that's the same command we used when we switched to a different commit. When we put in that commit hash and switch to the earlier version, we use git checkout. Well, we use the same command to switch branches as well. We're going to type dash b, and that means uh, to make a new branch. And then we're going to type the name of the branch. So I'm just going to call it temp branch. And we're going to get into branches a bit more in a bit, so don't worry if it's not clear at the moment. So I'll hit enter. So it now says switch to a new branch, temp branch. Type git status. Let's have a look at that. So it says nothing to commit because we've just committed this already. Type git log. So you can see now the git log has the initial commit and then the added detached change. change. It doesn't have the previous one added another change because we went back in time as it were. Okay, so what we've done, we had our original branch, which is called the master branch, by the way, that's where you start. We went back a stage, which meant we were sort of floating off away from the master timeline. And we made a new change. We added the detached head text up here in the text file. And then we added that to a new branch at that point. So we've got so our timeline kind of split and we've got this new point on it now. So we can have a look at all the branches that we have if we type git branch dash L. And now we can see which branches we've got. So we've got the master branch, we've got the temp branch and the temp branch has the little star next to it that tells us that we're currently on the temp branch. If we want to switch to the master branch, we can type git checkout master and hit enter. And if I click over here, this file is going to reload again. So you can see the master branch still has another change. And if I switch back to the temp branch, reload the file, we've got this change. So now we've got two separate versions. So the practical use for this, obviously I'm, this is a very contrived example, but the practical use would be, let's say you're working on a project and you want to add a new feature, but you don't want it to affect your main code in case you break something or maybe you've already sent that code to somebody else. So you, you just want to branch off and work on your little feature. So you make a feature branch. Maybe it's your synthesizer branch and you work on that. And then at some point, you're going to want to merge that back into your master branch. Uh, once you've got all the bugs fixed and everything, you're going to merge that into your master branch so that you can give it to your users. So we're going to do a merge now. We're going to take our change, which is detached head change, and we're going to add it into our master branch so that our master text file is up to date with our, our little feature branch, as we'll call it, our temp branch. So to do that, we have to switch to the master branch. So we'll go git checkout master. And now we're going to merge the temp branch. So when you do a merge, you always have to be on the branch that you want to merge other branches into. So we're on the master branch. We're going to merge the temp branch into the master branch. Okay, so we just type git merge and then the name of the branch. And I'm going to hit enter. Okay, now it says auto merging a text file. So it knows it's a text file, but it's found a conflict. Merge conflict in a text file. Automatic merge failed, fix conflicts, and then commit the result. So this is something you might come across. You won't come across it as much when you're developing highs, um, uh, highs projects, just because of the nature of um, the way highs projects are made. But you may come across it uh, with scripts and things like that. So if we click to reload the file now, so Git's tried to merge the files automatically, but it's come across a conflict because the version on the master branch, which is where we're at now, we're currently on the master branch. So that's represented by this word head. So everything between head and the equals is where we're currently at on the current branch. Everything between equals and this stuff here is where we are on the branch we're trying to merge, which is the temp branch. But of course, those both occupy the same line. 
in the actual file. They were both on line two. And Git noticed that they were both on the same line. It said, well, you can't have it both ways. Which one do you want? So this is why human read readable files are so much better, because we can just go in and tell it which ones we want. So we have to decide, how do we want this? Do we want it to say some text and then another change? Or do we want it to say some text and then detached head change? I actually want it to say both. So I'm just going to delete the lines I don't want it to have any more. So we'll have it like that. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to do git add, git commit. And for the commit message, I'm going to say merged temp branch and there we go, we've merged it now. So this is now set back to the master. So you can see we're still on the master branch. Uh, that's another one, branch dash L. So we're still on the master branch and this is what the master branch looks like now. If we go back to that temp branch, if we reload, the temp branch still looks like it did because we only merged the changes into the master branch. We didn't affect the temp branch. So we've still got this version so if we were still working on this feature separately, we can still add extra things to it and then merge those extra things back into the master branch later on. So this um, this makes it really easy to work on little modules and then merge them all together once you've got them working. You don't have to work on your master branch all the time. And in fact, it's, it's usually not good practice too because usually your master branch, especially if you're releasing it to the public, the public are going to be expecting that the master branch is stable, that the code's going to work. Um, so it's usually best to have a separate develop branch or a feature branch where you're doing all your development code and you don't merge it back into the master until it's stable. And that way users don't get any unexpected surprises. But it doesn't always work like that. Okay, so we're going to switch back to the master branch now. And let's actually delete that temp branch. So we type git branch dash D for delete and then the name of the branch. Now, it's really important to note that it doesn't give you a confirmation message. As soon as you press enter, it deletes that branch. So make sure you definitely want to do that. So there we go, deleted the branch. Let's clear that out. Let's have a look at the log. So we can see now how the log looks. And if I press enter, we can scroll down another line. So we've got the initial commit. We've got added another change. We've got added the detached change because we've actually still got that now. Uh, let's just reload that file. There we go. And then we merged it. And we've still got all these commit hashes so we can jump back in time and go to another detached head and make more changes and more commits if we wanted to. I'm going to press Q to come out of this. So we've had a look at a few commands so far. We've had git init to initialize the git repository. We've had git status to check if there's any file changes. We've had git add and then the file name or dash capital A or a dot to add the files to the staging area. And then we've had git commit dash M and a message to actually commit those changes into a, into a commit. That's only a few commands and there are a lot more commands. We're only going to look at a few more actually. Um, I'm only trying to cover the ones that I use on a day to day basis. There's uh, a whole load of other ones if you're doing more advanced things. But if you do want to know more about the commands that are available, the internet is the best resource. Go on there and you'll find explanations and just search. But there is a built-in help as well. So just type git dash dash help. And then there's a whole list of commands in here. And you can get further help on each of these commands. And um, so if we wanted to see what was available for the git log command, we could type git log dash dash help. And you see we've got the git manual now, and we can read all that's available for this. So it, the help is built in there. It's just git dash dash help, and there's a whole list of things. So that's the basics of version tracking with git. It's really not very complicated. Um, most of the time, you probably won't be having to uh, deal with a lot of branches. If you're just working on your own projects, you'll be dealing with one or two branches and a merge every now and again. Or some of you, if, if you're not sharing it with anybody, you might just prefer to work on the master branch. I often do this, especially with high projects because they're just small projects. So I'll just work on the master branch and um, never have to deal with a merge or branching or anything like that. 
So now let's look specifically at tracking a highs project. So I'm going to close these down. And let's close that. Delete that, in fact. And I'll open highs. And we'll create a new project folder. We'll actually create it on the desktop. I'll just call it highs project. And click OK. And let's just have a look. So we've got this highs project folder. So this is, let's get rid of that window. This is the default highs project folder structure. And all these folders are empty at the moment. Now in highs, when you save your files, you have the choice of saving as an archive or saving as XML. Always save as an XML. You can save as an archive as well if you want as a backup. And that's what you get when you press Control S. It'll save it as an as a archive. So it'll pop up with this. And you can save that. That's fine. But always save it as an XML. And the XML is the human readable file. And this is the one that Git can track more accurately. So I'll call it myproject.xml. So if we go back to the folder, we can see there's the XML. And in, where is it? Presets. Here's the .hip archive, which as you can see over here is a binary format. So that's not really very good for tracking. Okay, now we're going to initialize our Git repo. So I'm just going to open the terminal and I'm, I've already CD'd to the folder by clicking this button here, but that's just um, a nice feature of my operating system. And I'm going to type git init, and now we've got a repo in here. We'll turn on hidden files, and we can see there's the git folder there. And if we type git status, we're going to see that preset file. So it says there's a file in the presets folder, which we know there is. That's the .hip file. There it is. And it also says there's a file change in the XML preset backups folder, which is this one here. Uh, but it's not tracking them yet, so we need to tell it to track them. Now, I don't want it to track the presets folder because those are a binary format. It can't track them very well. It, it's not human readable and it can't track the content. So I'm not going to stage the presets folder. So I'm going to do git add XML preset backups. So I've added that one, but I've not added the presets folder and I'm not going to. And we'll look at a way of handling the presets folder shortly. So now I'm going to commit that as my initial commit. Now I'm going to make some changes here. What I recommend you do, um, let, let me add a sine wave generator. If you're working on a feature branch, let's say you're working on your synth branch or whatever your feature is, as well as using Git, I also recommend you save a different XML file. So call it synth branch or synth feature or whatever you want, synth module, and just have a separate XML file. It just makes it a bit easier because then if you do have to go back a stage, you don't have to deal with merging. And the reason I recommend you do that is because even though merging is easy with text files, when you're dealing with XML files, this is a fairly small XML file, it's not necessarily as straightforward. It's not as easy to um, manually fix conflicts, if, especially if you're not experienced with looking at XML. So just for simplicity, just keep multiple XML files and that might make your life easier. Uh, the main benefit I find using Git with Highs projects specifically is um, keeping track of my scripts, my JavaScript files. Okay, so now if we go to git status, again, it's telling us about the presets folder. We're not interested. And now it's telling us which file it's now found that is untracked in the XML preset backups folder. And that's that new XML we just created. So let's add that. Now we don't have to add the specific file. If we want to add all of the files in the XML preset backups folder that have been modified or not tracked, we can just type the name of the folder. We don't have to type slash and then whatever synth feature. Although you can do that if there's multiple files in the folder and you only want to track one. But we'll just add the folder. Git commit added synth feature. 
And there we can see the commits we've made so far. Let's clear that out. If we had some scripts, they'd be in the scripts folder and we could track those as well. There's nothing in here at the moment, just some empty folders that are made by default. Um, but there's certain things we don't want to track. So we don't want to track presets because they're a binary format, not very good to track. We don't want to track samples. You generally don't want to be tracking your WAV files because uh, those are going to end up being big files. And they're also a binary format. They're not a human editable, editable text format. So you don't want to track those. Sample maps you do want to track because they're XML. Um, MIDI files you may or may not want to track. Images you probably do want to track because they're going to be part of your um, your GUI. So the, the, the if you're changing versions of um, XML, you may want to change the images that go along with that. So I'd track the images folder, but that's up to you. But yeah, the images you probably want to track. Binaries, the name gives it away. You don't want to track that because those are bi going to be binary files. Audio files you probably do want to track because these are going to be small files like impulse responses and they can be integral to, to a project, especially if you're working on something like a reverb plugin. Additional source code, if you've got anything in there, you want to track that. What else do we have? User presets, yep, you want to track those. And uh, that's it. If you add any additional folders to the default folder structure, which I do in some of my projects, you can decide whether or not you want to track those. So if you want to ignore certain files, you don't want Git to track them, it's really easy. You just add a file called git ignore. So we can add that file now. So it's got to start with a dot and then git ignore. And then you open it up. Oops, let's open it in the text editor. And you just type in here the path or the files you want to you want it to ignore. So we want it to ignore uh, the samples. We want it to ignore binaries. Definitely want it to ignore presets. So now it's not going to track these files. So I'll close that. And if I type git status again, so it's no longer mentioned in the presets folder, which is good, but it is now saying that it's found a new file. Do I want to track it? Yeah, we want to track that one. So I'll add that. So usually you'd add the git ignore at the uh, before you initialize the project. So that would be part of your initial commit. So this is great because it means now if you upload your project to GitHub, your samples won't be uploaded and it's not going to upload the presets and it's not going to upload any files you don't want to track and uh, you don't want to upload. So that'll save bandwidth uh, as well. So let's go back to our little highs project here. So we've got, uh, are we on a separate branch? Uh, which branch are we on? Let's see. Oh, can't spell today. Branch. Okay, so we're on the master branch. Um, right, so we've got this one. Let's add. Um, so that's that. Let's open up the other one, my project XML. And let's add a sampler and we can add an effect to it. Okay, and I'll just save this as the XML. So my project XML, git status, git add, git commit, added sampler and effect. Okay. Now I'm going to make a new branch. I want to have my synth branch. So we're going to have git checkout, then dash b for branch, and we're going to have the synth branch. So now we've made a new branch. That's the dash b, and we're we're checking it out, that means we're switching to it. So we're doing it all in one command. You can do this as separate commands, but it's easier to do it as one. So if I do git branch dash L, we can see we're on the synth branch now. So let's make some changes. So we've, we've switched branch. Um, so I, I don't want this effect anymore, and I don't want this sampler. I'll go away. We're going to have a different effect. I'm going to have a delay, and I'm going to have a sine wave generator. So now I'm going to save this. And yes, you could save it as the synth feature, like I said before, but for this example, I'm just going to save over the My Project one. Okay, and if we go to Git status now, 
So as we modified that project file, we have, so we'll git add, git commit, added delay and sine wave gen. And that change has been made. Now let's have a look at the git project. So we'll go to XML backups. I'm, I'm going to delete this synth feature one for now. That served its purpose. So we'll just focus on this my project one here. I'm going to go back to the master branch and just watch the file size here. It's probably going to change. There we go, it changed. So it's 4.5. So now if I reload this, so we've got the sine wave generator and the delay. I'm going to reload it. And now we're back to the version with the sampler and the filter. And if we go back to the other branch, check out, uh, what do we call it? Was it synth? I think it was synth, wasn't it? Check out synth. So now we switch back to the synth branch. I reload the project again. We're back to the sine wave generator and the delay. So hopefully you can see the advantage of having multiple branches for multiple purposes. Now with a project like this, it might get a bit complicated if I try and merge them. Let's try it and let's see what happens. So go um, git checkout master, git merge synth. And it doesn't seem to have found any conflict. So I'm not going to, I'm not sure what it's going to have when we open it. I'm not sure if it's going to have the sampler or the sine wave generator. I've not actually tried this before. So let's just open it and see what it's got. Okay, so it's got the version with the sine wave generator. Okay, so it's a bit weird with the XML. I'm not sure why it would um, go with just that version. But um, let's just have a look. Yeah, so we are on the master branch. So however Highs works out the XML or how Git is working out the XML, and um, we no longer have that sampler in there. So that's another reason why I suggest you keep multiple XML files and rely on Git more for keeping track of your scripts because weird things can happen with XML. Yeah, it didn't give us the opportunity to change any conflicts or anything. So, so yeah, keep, keep multiple versions. Now, if we did want to go back to that version with the sampler, we could um, do something like Git log. And there's the version with the sampler, added sampler and effects. So we've got the commit for it. So we could check out this, git checkout, paste that in there. Oh, I didn't copy it. Let's just copy that. Paste that in. And again, we're on, we're now a floating detached head. but we're back to our sampler version. So it's still there in the commit history. It's just, it isn't merged the way we wanted it to in, into the master, but it, I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. Okay, so now let's look at using Git with GitHub. Um, like I say, GitHub is a place where you can upload your code to share with other people and there, there's a few other ones. I think there's one called GitLab as well, but GitHub is the most well known. And um, I, I like the layout of GitHub. I think it's really straightforward. So that's the one I've used. Uh, so I recommend you use GitHub. So let's go to the website. Let me just close all this stuff down. Let's close that. So this is GitHub. Uh, it's just github.com. Now, when you go here, it's probably going to look a bit different and you're going to need to log in you know, or uh, make an account if you don't have an account. But once you have an account, you'll come to a sort of dashboard like this. Uh, if you've got any repositories, they'll appear on um, the left hand side here. So let's start off by learning how to upload your local project that you've been working on on your own system. Let's just get rid of those again. Um, your local project, let's see how you can upload that to GitHub. Because the great thing about Git is that you can do it locally on your machine and you don't have to wait for anybody else to give you permission to upload or make changes or anything like that. Like it's it's just great. It's re you're completely independent. Um, whereas with some version control systems, you're relying on other people's servers being available and stuff like that. But GitHub sort of allows us to 
bridge the gap so you have the best of both worlds. So we're going to upload our local project to GitHub. Um, so let's go to GitHub first of all, and you click on this new button over here, or you click start a project over here. And you're going to give it a name, and I'm just going to call this um, test git project. And you can see it's added dashes between it, it doesn't like spaces, fair enough. Uh, you can give it a description, this is a test repo. And then you can choose to make it public or private. All my repos are public by the way, if you want to see any of my code it's all on GitHub. Uh, you can add a readme file to the repo if you want. You can add a .git ignore file, we've already done that. And you can add a license file if you want. You really should add a license and you should also put the license information at the top of every script file. Um, especially if you're going to release it under um, a free license like the GNU license or the MIT license, one of those. You should definitely put the license in there and you've got to put the license in the top of each file so people who get the files independently without ever seeing your Git repo will still know what the license terms are. So then we click create repository, just give it a moment. It actually gives us the instructions here of what we need to do. So we're going to push an existing repository from the command line. So we just have to run these two commands basically inside our folder from the terminal. So I'll open the terminal and we're at that folder already. And we're just going to run these two commands. So the first command adds what's called a remote to our local repo. So the local git repo um, has this thing called a remote where it um, knows that the files are kept remotely rather than locally. And it can track the remote for changes. So we'll do that. So now we've added the remote. And then we're going to do this command, which is git push. And you'll use this command fairly frequently. Um, so git push. And then we're saying origin master. So I don't really care about the ins and outs of these functions. I just copy and paste it. And now it's pushing it all up from our local folder to GitHub. And if I click the link, it's now here on GitHub. So you'll notice it hasn't pushed all the folders because they haven't been tracked because they don't have files in them. And if we go into the XML preset backups, you can see that the synth feature XML is there, even though we actually deleted it. And that's just because GitHub's still tracking it and it's somewhere in the version history. If we click this commits button here, we can actually see a breakdown of the timeline. So we can see all our commits, which is a bit nicer than looking at it in the terminal. We can also switch branches here. There's only one branch currently, but if you had multiple branches, you can switch it there or by clicking branches here and you can see all the branches there. So let's look at making another change and pushing it to the Git repo. So I'm not going to open highs for this. I'm just going to add a, a fake script file. So we'll just create a new file, call it myscript.js, and we'll put some text in here. This is some JavaScript. No, it's not. Okay, and we've got our highs project. We're going to do git status. And oh, we're still on that detached head. Let me just go back to the master branch. Just clear all that out. Okay, so we're going to go git status. And it can see now, now that I've switched back to the master, it's seen now that I've deleted that feature, um, XML, and I've made some change in the scripts folder. So, which is adding that fake JavaScript file. So we're going to add both of these. And I'm not going to put a very useful commit message. I'm just going to put made some changes. You shouldn't do this. You should put meaningful commit messages. So I've made some changes and it's uh, acknowledged what they are. And now we're going to send these changes to our remote GitHub repository. And the command for that is really easy. Just type git push and hit enter. Uh, you will have to sign in when you do that. You'll be prompted in the terminal. I've been using git today already and I've already put in my um, login details. So it's automatic. But the first time you do it, you'll have to put in your login details into the terminal. So you can see it's uploaded this data now to GitHub. So if we refresh the page, 
We can now see the six commits, the scripts folder has appeared, and if we go into XML preset backups, that synth file has disappeared. We can look at the commits, and we can see made some changes has been added as a commit. We can see when it was committed. Now, if you want to go back in time on GitHub rather than in the terminal, you can do that. You've got over here the git commit hashes. These are shortened versions of the hashes that we were seeing in the terminal. So we can click one of those, and this will show us the changes in that commit. So the stuff that's in a sort of pinky red color, those were things that were taken out, and the stuff that was in is in the green color is stuff that was added. And the name of the file is up here at the top. If we go back to this page, if you want to browse all of the files at that particular moment in time, just click this button here. And then we go back to this version and we can see both of the files are in there again. So this is the same branch, we're just in a different period of time on that branch, we've gone back in time. Okay, now let's look at downloading an existing repository, for example, the highs repository. So let's go to the highs GitHub page. So we'll just search for highs in here. Um, where is it? Highs, there we go. So this is the highs GitHub page. And you can see there's been a lot of commits and there's 19 branches. The last one, the most recent change is eight hours ago. So let's look at how we download this to our computer. So I'm going to close these folders here. So we go to this button here, clone or download. And you can just download it all as a zip file, but we're going to use GitHub to manage it. So you want to copy this link and you can do that just by clicking this button here. So that's now on my clipboard. So I'm going to create this new local Git repository of the highs remote repository on my desktop. So I'm just going to open a terminal and I'm going to CD to the desktop. And to create the repository here, I'm just going to type git clone, and then I'm going to paste in that link that I copied from GitHub. And now it's going to download all the files and it's created the folder on the desktop over here. So that's done, and we can CD into there as well. And if I open it, close this extra window, there we go. So we can see it's just cloned this GitHub repository. So that's how you do that, and now if Let's say Christoph makes a change and you want to add it into your local version. You can, there's two commands. You can type git fetch, which pulls any changes. There are no changes because we've got the latest version, but it would pull any changes and it would keep them on your system, but it wouldn't integrate them with the high source code. So you're probably not going to want to use fetch, but just know that that's what that command does. It pulls down the files and it keeps them on your system, but it keeps them separate from your working branch. And they're just there waiting for you to um, pull them into the existing files that you're actually working on. The command you're probably going to use is git pull. And what this does is it does a git fetch and then it does a merge. So it merges them into the existing files. So you do git pull. So you're probably going to use git pull most of the time when working with highs, but just be aware that git fetch is also there to pull changes in as well. So it tells us we're up to date, which we already knew because we've got the latest version. But let's say we want to switch to a different branch. Let's switch to the, the script node branch. So we'll do git branch, then we type dash L, and it says we only have the master branch because we only clone the master branch. When we went to clone or download, it gave us the master branch. Now, in previous versions of Git, uh, you had to do some more complicated stuff to add other remote branches. So if we wanted the script node branch, for example. But in the latest version of Git, it's really simple to switch branches to remote branches. So if we go back to GitHub, we'll click branches. So you've got to know the name of the branch you want. So we're going to switch to script node. And all you do, you just imagine that the branch is already on your system. Just type git checkout and then the name of the branch and Git's automatically going to um, sync up your local Git repository with the one on the GitHub server and switch to that branch for you. So there we go, and it says it's already set up to track the remote script node branch, and it's switched to the branch for us. So if I type git branch again, 
we can now see we've got the master and the script node and we're on the script node branch. So really easy and then we can switch back to the master. Now most of the time when you're downloading highs to build it for yourself you're going to want to be on one of the develop branches you're not going to be on the master branch so that's how you would switch to whichever branch is currently the uh, most recently updated. Now there's another thing I want to show you with downloading um, somebody else's repository uh, it won't work with the highs one as you'll see in a minute so we'll just ignore that for now so we're actually going to download one of mine so we're going to download Sophia Woodwinds and we're going to do exactly the same thing copy that over just do it on the desktop again uh, git clone and paste that in and let it clone Sophia Woodwinds So this is the Sophia Woodwinds folder. And you see I've got the git ignore file in there. And I've got some other stuff in here. But this is this is my git pro this is my highs project for Sophia Woodwinds. If we go into the scripts folder, we can see we've got this folder here, high scripting framework. And this is a, a collection of scripts I use in a lot of my projects. Uh, but it's empty. And this is called a git submodule. So back on GitHub, if we go into the scripts, high scripting framework the folder isn't empty but when we do the git clone it doesn't download that folder automatically and that can be a bit annoying so there are two ways we can um, get it to download that folder the first one we can do is if we go into this Sophia Woodwinds and we go into the scripts folder we can type the command git submodule in it and that will get the submodules initialized there we go it's found the submodules and then we have to type git submodule update and that will now download the submodule into the scripts folder and there it is so just be aware that if you're dealing with a repository that uses a submodule you need to um, you, you might need to download it separately if you've already downloaded the main repository and a submodule is basically another git repo and it's just a way of sort of putting a repo in a repo but that's a more complicated thing I'm not going to get into in this video but we can talk about that in another video if it's something you're interested in. So what we did here was we downloaded Sophia Woodwinds via the git clone and then we downloaded the submodule. Well there's another way to do it. Okay so the way we download it with the submodules right from the start is we type git clone dash dash recurse make sure you're where you want to be by the way I've gone back to the desktop here uh, dash submodules and then you put that URL we got from github from here and then hit enter and now it'll download it it'll clone the repository and it will include the submodules so if we go into the Sophia Woodwinds folder now go into scripts let's get rid of that one and we can see it's downloaded the high scripting framework submodule right from the start. So that's just a bit of an easier way to do it really. Okay guys, so that's about it for this video. I hope I've given you enough to get started using Git for your own highs projects. If you have any questions, suggestions or comments, please leave them below the video on YouTube or in uh, alongside the video on Patreon. All right, until next time, bye for now.